um, workshop was kind of born last fall. Um, I was sitting next to an older man at a climate workshop um, and I don't remember many of the details on that 20 minute presentation. There were a lot of slides and graphs and numbers and statistics and it was all about how climate change is going to affect Montana specifically. Mm -hmm. So you know it was pretty scary stuff. But what I remember um, is Kirk's story and I got his permission um, to share it with you. Most of my adult life has been devoted to climate research, mostly focused on the ocean. In that period of my life, I assumed that the science of climate and climate change was the most important thing. We felt that society would respond once the facts were known. Now I realize we were very naive. As soon as the companies providing fossil fuels became aware of the climate change problem, when the IPCC was formed in the 1990s, they began a huge misinformation campaign. This became very effective and was very effective in public opinion from the year 2000 on. And then he wrote also that, I was a member of a team that wrote a report for the National Academy warning of climate change in 1982. It had an effect on the science community, but an almost zero effect on public policy. This was very discouraging. So that was pretty powerful hearing that from an actual client scientist. And that kind of got me started like, so why haven't we changed our habits? Why haven't we changed our public policy? Why are we still um, having our head in the sand about this? Um, my climate story, I've always kind of been into, you know, trying to do right by the planet, but I really got serious about it a year ago when I was there in Indonesia. Uh, my family went on a three week surf trip um, to the Mentawai Islands in the middle of the Indian Ocean. Um, we uh, went on a 12 hour boat ride out to this island chain. Um, and it was absolutely incredible, you know, coconut palms, white sand beaches, turquoise water, and above that high tide line there, solid plastic. It, was, it broke my heart. And so I decided that I had to do better. Like our, I, so we looked at what changes our family could make. And one of them was I knew how to make soap, so I would start making shampoo bars. Um, so. I did. We committed to using less plastic. So these are two beaches that I've been to in the last year. One of the first one is a beach in Indonesia and the second one was last winter in Baja. And the beaches of San Diego would look like that also if uh, people didn't pick it up every day. So um, our family stopped buying dairy, we cut our air travel, we started, we committed to buying secondhand fashion. Um, and honestly, it's been a lot more difficult to eliminate plastic in our lives. I've been largely unsuccessful in that goal um, than it was to stop other like big behaviors, like stop flying and cutting out dairy and beef from our diet. So today we're going to cover the layers of protection that we put up to avoid thinking about the climate crisis, like on a personal level and also as a society. And so then we're going to talk about how best to approach the problem, how to flip those defenses that we put up um, and use them. And then our experiences, and that's the writing portion of it, is where we are going to explore what story we have around the climate crisis. And then lastly, how to talk and mostly how to listen about in a climate change conversation. So as Kirk mentioned, scientists have been warning us about the global warming crisis for about 30 years. And so why haven't we acted? Why have we let our planet get so gross? And the answer is that we have a messaging problem. The message just isn't getting through. Um, so I got really curious and what I found out is what I'm going to share with you today. Um, so this is the message that we're getting from society 
And this is the reality of what that beach um, look, sunset looked like. <laughs> There's a six pack ring right there in the picture. So the five layers of defense that we put up, and this is all um, research done by a man named Per Espen Stokness, and he is a climate researcher and a psychologist. And he does has a great book called "What We Think About Climate: What We Think About When We Try Not to Think About Climate Change." Um, so, the five layers of defense. Um, dis, the first is distance. So there we are in the middle, the little smiley face, um, and the distance is that climate change seems a really like a really big problem and it just seems really far away. It seems like something that's really maybe not even going to affect us here in Montana. Um, you know, it's like for polar bears and orangutans and stuff like that. It's not going to. Um, and also it seems really big, like it's outside of our circle of influence. And so we feel out of control and we feel helpless when we think about it. Um, and then the second layer of defense is doom. So when we hear headlines, um, they're all death and disaster and sacrifice and loss. And they're big, scary headlines. And they're preaching gloom and doom. And that throws us into fear. Um, and then after a while, it, we get fatigued about hearing about all that doom and gloom. Um, the third layer is dissonance. And this is really, um, to me, it's kind of that, like talking about integrity. So we know that flying and driving and plastic commute, contribute to climate change and global warming, um, but we do them anyway. And so our brain comes up with excuses and justifications so that we can continue our life comfortably. You know, China's a bigger carbon emitter than we are. I'm not as bad as some people. Um, or they doubt climate change altogether. Um, denial is kind of having a, the double life. So you're not talking about it. You're trying not to think about it. You just live and act as if you don't know about the problem. Um, and also with denial, we look around us and we see our peers, the other people in society, acting normally. And they're going about their lives and they're not making drastic changes. They're not, you know, giving up flying or, you know, wearing all hemp clothing or, you know, they're just shopping at Target and being normal. And so we all just keep calm and carry on because we're social animals. And then the last defense is identity. And this is really um, like a cultural identity. And um, in the United States, at least, your politics determine your view on climate change, really. It's become politicized um, liberals versus conservatives. And so now that we know the five layers that we put up, um, we can talk about how to transform those into action. And that leads us to the five S's, which match up with the five layers. So when we talk about distance, um, we can flip that to social proof. Um, so humans are social animals. And so if we see our peers taking action, then that social proof, so you know, electric cars and solar panels and bringing your water bottles and you know, all of these little social proofs that become socially acceptable um, help us to bridge that distance that it's here and it's now. And you know, climate change is trending so supportive health replaces doom. So instead of this huge doom and gloom, big scary problem, um, it's helpful to focus on human health. So um, plant-based diets, new jobs, clean air, pure water. Um, and instead of dissonance, we can focus on simpler actions. So nudges is what um, he was referring to there 
Um, so like, for example, like in a restaurant um, that is dealing with a lot of food waste, a nudge would be that they serve on smaller plates or at the buffet, they provide smaller plates so that people don't take as much and then therefore they don't waste as much. Um, the signals are um, how we can visualize our progress. Um, and he was talking a lot about technology, um, like mapping our, elect our energy use or um, tracking our waste. Um, but for, you know, maybe we can just do that ourselves with um, noticing how much less we're having to buy at the grocery store because we're growing so much or composting, you know, we are, we're not throwing much away anymore because we're able to recycle or compost everything we're buying. Um, and then the last one uh, for identity um, is to tell stories. And that identity really feels kind of like the, the last barrier before we can really accept it. Um, and humans love stories and we don't have to just tell like you know our stories about our vacation where we saw a bunch of plastic we can talk about like where we are where we've been where we're going our hope for the future um, and then telling stories about all of the other s's um, and by stories i don't mean like um, anything like untruthful like lies or anything like that i just mean like just talking about our lives and telling um Instead of just uh, facts and figures and numbers, we're letting people in and being vulnerable. Um, so back to the surf trip story. Um, my uh, barriers were broken down on that trip because living in Montana, you know, pollution and plastics do seem kind of distant. Um, but on my trip, it was just all right there in my face, you know, on the beach, there were chip wrappers and flip flops and shampoo bottles and, you know, all the plastic that I'd ever used and thrown away was represented there on that beach. Um, and then for doom, I'd been hearing about global warming my whole life. And um, so I'd felt them for sure. And so reframing it as um, human health gives me control over um, my choices instead of having it be such a huge issue. Um, the nudging, I think we all probably, the simple actions, we probably all are making those in our lives now, you know, making choices to reuse and avoid single use plastics. Um, and then, uh, the the denial the the dissonance goes down as our actions change so as we're making those simple actions as we're supporting our health as we're telling our stories um, that feeling of hypocrisy that you know that you're what you're doing is not right but you have to do it anyway that feeling goes down as you begin to change um, and so that brings us to the stories so I brought some um, ancient printer paper and some pens. Um, and so if you don't mind passing, out, passing around some paper, um, we're going to take some time. And I have some writing prompts that we're going to go through. Um, and then it would be great. I'm going to ask you guys to share with each other out loud, which I know is scary. but. You can do it. OK, so we're just going to take a couple minutes on each question. And I'm not going to give you like 10 minutes so you're sitting there bored. But just kind of jot down just, just some first things that come to your mind. It doesn't have to be in relation to the environment. But if you can think of something that you've changed your mind about. All right. Um, who would like to go first and share what they changed their mind about? I'll go first. Thank Break you. Ice. You're awesome. <laughs> All right. So I changed my mind about the range of things I feel like I can impact. I used to just uh, feel like I could only 
impact things in uh, the field that I was trained in and um, started out automatically with a certain amount of respect in. Um, and I've since realized, I've changed my mind about that, that um, um, if I approach it correctly, I can impact a lot of things that I don't start out with a certain cachet in. I've also, um, I grew up in an era where um, if someone was, had an addiction or a mental health problem, it was considered to be a moral defect in them, and I changed my mind about that. Um, over the last several decades, um, to more of an understanding that addictions are a health problem. Thank you so much. I'm you, not gonna get up. You don't have to stand up. I've decided to use less honey because I just learned that a worker bee lives about six weeks on average and only makes a, like a quarter teaspoon of honey in that time. And I use like a lot. <laughs> a quarter teaspoon? A quarter teaspoon. Oh, thanks. Six <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. Stevia, here we come. No. Is that, no. Blech. Okay. <laughs> I'll go. Thank um, you. It's just uh, all, the, all the plastic wrapping, all the, you know, individual, like, you know, see it even on Instagram, sometimes things come through and it's like, why are you wrapping individual grapes or half of them? Oh my gosh, I know. So We're peeling the pre-peeled oranges? Pre -peeled oranges. <laughs> so it just feels to bring, good to bring your own bags and it also feels better to grow your own. Right, yeah, it's part of that, like, you know, keeping your integrity whole, you know, so you're not like poking holes in it, buying an orange in a plastic wrap. I think it's hard to think of a lot of things if you started making these changes 20, 30 years ago, mm -hmm. because they're so far removed, like, well, this is the way I've lived for so long, at least attempting to. My problem is I live in a house with three other adults, two adult children and my wife. And I'm the only one that can tolerate a 68 degree house. Everybody else wants a 75. Uh -huh. and they clap when I walk in the door because I'm gone all day today, and it'll be 75 degrees in the house when I get home. Yeah. And so I guess that's my thing is I can sit in the house with a blanket and a couple of sweaters and sit there at 65 degrees and feel perfectly fine. And that's a big change that I've tried to make, but I have a difficult time getting anybody else. To, and I guess that's just society in general. That's not the way I think. You're not going to change my mind, let alone the guy sitting next to you on the couch. So. Right. Yeah. Well, let's move along to the next question. By, um, um, by the way, there's seven, so we're right on track. Um, so what have you heard about climate change, ecosystem collapse, or mass extinction? And what have you seen? And what have you experienced? Does anyone have one they're up for sharing? Yeah, Laura. Um, this one, uh, I say I have heard climate change is real and serious and imminent. We are in the midst of a mass extinction. Ecosystems are collapsing all around the world. Am I the only one who is hearing this? I have seen here and now the evidence of climate change and ecosystem change, and I believe the scientists who are telling me these things. Over the past two years, I've seen a number of very disturbing headlines, um, specifically in The Guardian, and I've hunted up the actual scientific papers that those um, headlines have come from and I've got a uh, scientific bent and I know how to read a science paper uh, published journal paper one of them was uh, a South American jungle study in the 1980s they set out sticky traps for 20, 24 hours and then counted 
the number of insects that were stuck on the sticky traps. Mm -hmm. And there were some traps that, that the data was limited because there was no area of stickiness <laughs> that another insect could stick in. And they repeated the same study um, a few years ago, and there was a 97% decrease in the insect biomass measured that way. There were sticky traps that only had two or three insects. Mm -hmm. That's a, a devastating indication of the collapse of the insect um, biome. Similar uh, study showing an 87% decrease in insect migration through a certain German pass, mountain pass. And then um, there was a study of, uh, in a permafrost, in a valley uh, in the Arctic um, with a permafrost layer. I mean, it was far enough north that everything's permafrost, right? And they flew in in the 70s and landed their plane and did their study and flew out and they went back to repeat the study and they couldn't land because instead of a flat um, permafrost swamp, um, it was huge blocks of earth had been um, thrown up. It was heaved. Heaved. Yeah. And that showed that in that one valley, the permafrost is melting because now it's heaving into mounds and hills and valleys. Scary stuff, very impactful. Yeah. Uh, 40 years ago when I moved to Boise, the average last frost date was June 10th. Four years ago when I moved from there, I set my tomatoes out the first week in May with no protection. Mm -hmm. So we've got like, they have an extra two months of summer and we had 40 years ago down there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which brings us to our next question. What breaks your heart about our ecological breakdown? I promise we won't just keep spiraling downward. I, was I promise. Ask. No, we're going to we're going to go back up. I promise. <laughs> Anybody got one there willing to share? I kind of feel like it takes it takes such a mass breakdown for uh, the larger population to recognize what is occurring on a daily basis or monthly, yearly. Um, for instance, like the mass flooding in in Europe. The, you know, um, I forget the cities, but they're like underwater for weeks. Um, and then also like our, our, our wildfires are, are bigger and bigger and bigger every year. It just takes such a catastrophic event for people to recognize what's going on. It's just concerning. Mm -hmm. Everything. <laughs> it's heartbreaking. Um, we've taken for granted that we'll always have bird song in the morning, monarch My butterflies, God. and orca whales, and, and we won't. And yeah, I, like, I get so excited about little things, and my kids think I'm a little crazy because of it, but maybe they're going to remember when they're adults, like, oh my gosh, remember? Mommy used to get so excited about this, and now that's not even here. It's heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. It breaks my heart thinking of the amount of suffering that's going to happen because of the very high probability of mass human mm -hmm. migrations. Yeah. And to that, I, I felt a little guilty myself. The first thing I thought of was the animals and nature and natural ecosystems, ecological breakdown, and I thought, well, it will, ecological breakdown will lead to human suffering, but shame on me, I didn't think of the humans first. Mm -hmm. I, I thought of losing the, the critters in the natural world first. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. <clears throat> and this is the last one. That's looking at the dark side. What did you have planned for 10 years from now? A vision for your life, hopes for your children and grandchildren that potentially now are in flux or in limbo, depending on what happens with our climate crisis. And kind of piggybacking on that one is how has climate change affected people you love? Anybody up for telling us what you wrote? I'm always up for it. So Thank you, you Walter. I really appreciate it. it. So <laughs> I'm one of the very lucky ones in that I didn't have children. But having said that, other people have children. And other people have had children who I care about. And although I didn't specifically in the past feel like I had a internally voiced hope for stability and status quo for them, what's changed is that now I think they won't have stability and status quo. How has climate change affect the people you love? Well, I have members of my extended family who are on the are climate denialists mm -hmm. and I feel sorry for them when the shit hits the fan. Anybody uh, else? Is, we're all in the same boat. Yeah, we're, we're all in it side. together. <laughs> yeah. My two children living with us at home are the same way. It's a bunch of bullcrap people, don't care, it doesn't matter. There's nothing I can do can change it. Well, I kind of put the five defenses up there for ourselves, but it also works to help get through to other people. All right, so fast forward to 15 years from now. How did we save ourselves? So this is where we get into looking for, um, looking forward into the future. Pretend you're writing yourself a letter from 15 years in the future. Who'd like to go first? All right, let's hear it, Walter. Do you all remember, think back to 2023, the year when things got so exponentially bad, so fast, that no one, absolutely no one, be they individuals, corporations, or political bodies, could possibly make any argument against what was happening and what needed to be done. By 2024, you'll remember you couldn't even find anyone who admitted to having been a denialist. The tipping points that the earth went through in 2022 and 2023 resulted in tipping points of political and individual action that have brought us to the stable condition we are in today and <laughs> hope for the future. Yeah. Right on. It's kind of a bummer of a vision that things have to get so bad to push us over, but you know when they say you have eight years to use up and your uh, carbon uh, budget will be used up and now it's six and a half and we haven't done anything. You know, we're in it. We're in it. This is it. Yeah. <laughs> yep. I, I feel like it has to be, I mean, unfortunately, nobody is, I mean, not many people are changing on their own. Like it, it needs to be like a top I agree. kind of thing. Yeah. So it's got to come from the top and just be like, these are the rules. 
you only get this much fuel per week or you know it's just got to be just it's got to be strict and it's got to be in the law which sounds awful but that's how change a lot of times happens yeah. well and also we just have to reach a tipping point where it becomes unacceptable mm -hmm. to pollute or to you know waste anything societally i think yeah, yeah. anyone else no okay last one and then your family can't You'll use up your energy budget <laughs> by Wednesday. It's not even an option on your thermostat. <laughs> um, so the last one is, what opportunities are we being presented with? Anyone have any excellent opportunities? Yeah, Laura. <laughs> Tag. It says I'm here on account of CCL, which stands for Citizens Climate Lobby, um, and what we're here to do is to educate the public on a political solution to climate change, which is advocating for a carbon fee and dividend program, or more specifically, the Energy Innovation Act. Um, anyway, uh, that is uh, basically uh, our, our mission is to say, if you're concerned about uh, climate change, I have uh, an opportunity to expose you to, yeah, to introduce you to. Mm -hmm. So for me, basically the same thing. The opportunity is that we've now, just in the past, seems like year, year and a half, a bipartisan acceptance of the need for action. Uh, and that's an opportunity we can encourage. The other opportunity is human nature. People as individuals are very good at making decisions in their best interest. So we can use government to inject a what would seem like a pretty um, non-intrusive market signal into the economic environment that people will happily respond to because it's in their best interest. And that's just Citizen Climate Lobby's plan of, of introducing a carbon fee to make fossil fuel based activities more expensive and people will automatically change their behavior and be and do it with a with a, a smile on their face because they know they're doing things in their best interest not because it's good for the environment because it's cheaper to do so so we we can argue with climate deniers using facts and figures, but really that's just two people talking at each other instead of having an actual conversation. So um, when you, I wrote an article for Montana Woman called How to Have a Climate Conversation, and it tells the story of how I, I got my butt kicked at a, not for real, but um, at a family dinner with some um, relatives oh, that were did, conservative. Yeah. Oh, did you? Yeah. yeah. And it was really difficult and it was, you know, kind of sad. Um, <laughs> but I learned a lot and so I hope I can do better next time. Um, and so these first four are really just about being a good listener. And that for a lot of us is a big challenge in itself and takes a lot of bravery just to do those first four. Um, and then after that, you know, you look for common ground, you go with the flow of the conversation, you know, you get curious, you ask questions about where they heard that, why they believe that, how can you verify that information, um, you know, you admit when you don't know instead of making things up. And then, you know, we don't preach, we talk about like, you know, we share our, our heart and how, for me, it, it breaks my heart that the world that my kids live in is not going to be the world that we even have now and that how much anxiety they have about that and how much 
um, stress that my 10-year-old feels about climate change. Um, and I don't talk about it very much. <laughs> he just gets it from society. Um, so, and then I have other articles. Um, I have one that I wrote about a letter from the future that talks about um, some changes that I hope we make. Um, and then my climate story is in the first issue of uh, Montana Woman since Megan um, took it over. And does anyone have anything, any ahas that they want to share from, from being here? And Yes. Um, uh, the aha was uh, the letter from the future. I, it was so boldly, openly political in nature. <laughs> um, uh, and anyway, that was a shocker to me that um, the, the, the letter was saying, oh, thank you, thank God we, we pushed these political programs back 15 or 20 years ago when the time was right to get started on them. Um, anyway, so that was kind of an eye-opener that um, maybe the solutions are political and maybe we shouldn't be so ashamed about um, proposing them or so badly bullied about proposing them. Well, that's a lot of times the way change happens is that at, people, at first people are really resistant to the program and then after they've lived with it for a little while, then they're really thankful for it because they see the effects of it. Is, the, is part, of the, part of the issue though that most of America still lives in tight urban communities that have never actually been in the environment? They don't notice it's changed. And so that's, I mean, climate scientists are saying the most important thing that we can do as you know people without a ton of power um, is talk about it and so by having the discussions even though you know it takes a lot of um, it's a big leap to to have this conversation because it is controversial to people who you know deny that it's happening um, but if we have more conversations about what we're seeing, what we're feeling, what, you know, our, our hopes and dreams, what we're grieving, you know, I'm grieving that, you know, that I don't get to travel the world because airplanes are so unsustainable. And I'm grieving that my children have a different future and they're probably gonna die of climate change instead of old age. And, you know, we have to acknowledge what's happening and talk about it because most of us aren't talking about it at all. I mean, how many times in the last week have you had a climate conversation? With I don't know. Anyone besides her? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know that I have. I had several this morning. Yeah, that's true, I had several. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So recently, it's a very difficult area to have a conversation in. Mm. It is. Because mm -hmm. everybody's, most people's livelihood around here is resource-based. When I go to our local bar out in Marion, uh, there's nobody I can have a conversation with, so I just sit and listen. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but it's a tourist-based economy, even if it used to be based on harvesting um, timber. It's now tourist-based, and so climate disaster is still brought, uh, really problematic for that. Yeah, so then in that case, we look for common ground and we look for what do we, what are we both passionate about? We're both passionate about wildlife, you know, like we want there to still be elk in Montana, <laughs> you know. We want there to be rivers with fish in it and snow to well, ski. Resource and resource people want the, the trees and forests to be healthy, but only so they can come down. Right. It's like Trout Unlimited wants us to have all the trout in the world so we can catch them. And release them. No, we like to release them. <laughs> so um, that's all I had prepared for you guys. Yeah? I have something uh, helpful to say. Um, there's more being done about the electric electrification of air travel than you are probably aware of. Really? I had no idea. Yeah. Most people are unaware of that. They kind of think, 
well, maybe some folks are fooling with electric cars, but there are actual companies that are fooling with electric aircraft and huh. testing them. Um, and there's a lot of um, attractiveness in electric aircraft for short hop kind of puddle jumper type of, of air travel trips, which are already very problematic for um, jet fuel uh, jet aircraft right now. So those, th there's, there's just enormous uh, profitable use of basically battery electric aircraft um, being proposed. Uh, and even though it may be a while longer for long haul aircraft um, to be electrified, it will decrease the amount of um, fuel used in air travel in, in civil aviation by a huge amount. Um, right. And will thus open up uh, air travel vacations. Yeah. And the point is that although it's not possible with the technology we have right now today, mm -hmm. there is a very reasonable pathway where we could reach electrification of at least short hop uh, yep. airlines. It's an opportunity, right? As far as an aha moment goes, um, over the last year, um, I've looked at a number of different sectors and come to realize that it's possible to decarbonize everything. I learned it through the seeds last year that it's possible to decarbonize agriculture. Um, Sweden has a plan where they're going to reimburse the three iron smelters that they have in the country for their stranded assets because otherwise they would just keep doing what they've been doing for the next 20 years because the plants, the smelters were built to be depreciated and used over 30 years, but they're going to pay to have them um, redone so that they can or, uh, decarbonize the iron smelting um, processes um, by converting them to hydrogen gas instead of burning coal, they're going to burn hydrogen for the heat that's required to melt everything. Um, and that means Sweden will have three iron smelters that do not, that, that can be a pilot project for the entire world. If they can do it, the rest of the world can decarbonize the iron production industry. And then all we need is to make hydrogen out of solar power instead of making it out of methane, and we're there. Hmm. Humans are so smart. We have such big brains. I mean, we're, we just need to turn our ingenuity on this problem instead of making money, yeah. <laughs> well, instead I of greed. <laughs> So I wondered if anyone had any questions about um, this one. Um, because this is, um, I don't know that I did a great job explaining it, but it's um, super powerful tools for being able to, like I used all of this in the articles that I write. I try to make sure that I build these in to the, to the articles so that without knowing it, um, I'm speaking to these, you know, the nudges, um, the visualizing, social proof, all of that. And if you want to watch his TED talk, it's a good review. Perespin Stokes. Stokeness. Stokeness. I don't know how to say. <laughs> so that's it. Thank you guys all for coming. Oh, thank you. And there's, um, I brought some copies of Montana Woman and you guys are welcome to take them. Mm -hmm.